If you want an illustration of the principle that history doesn't repeat but it rhymes, consider this. In 2001, protesters in India ransacked a McDonald's restaurant in Bombay. Hindu nationalists accused the company of secretly cooking its fries in beef fat, something that would be considered a massive betrayal of trust by the millions of vegetarian Hindus that they served. It wasn't true. French fries and other vegetarian products that are being served in India do not contain any beef, pork or any other animal extract of whatsoever kind. Eventually, Indian food laboratories gave the company a clean bill of health on the subject, confirming that only vegetable oil was used in the restaurants in India. But it was a fascinating echo of history because it was a very similar charge that ignited the Indian mutiny. The suggestion that Indian soldiers serving the British Empire were being given cartridges that had been greased with cow fat. In that case, the consequences were bigger, literally life and death, but it was also a company that was at the heart of it. That company was the East India Company, a British firm that you could argue accidentally created the British Empire. How that happened is the topic of this video. Now, I can guess what you're thinking. How ridiculous to say that something like the British Empire was created by accident and in any case by a private company. And while there are lots of people in this story who should take responsibility for the actions that they took within it, there are certain key moments where very important things just kind of happened by accident. Let me give you an example. Consider Run Island, one of the Banda Islands east of Indonesia. Run is a tiny, tiny island, under two miles long, less than two thirds of a mile wide, a speck not even able to make an appearance at all on most maps. Pretty much in the middle of nowhere, especially if you're an English sailor of the turn of the 17th century. It had no source of fresh water, nothing whatsoever to commend it, except it did have a large number of nutmeg trees. Nutmeg as a spice was highly valued at the time. Nowhere else in the world did the trees flourish so well, and therefore was their fruit with the precious kernels so cheap to buy. I quite like nutmeg. Pretty sure I wouldn't sail halfway round the world in an old sailing ship in order to get it. It would have to be a good deal to get people to sail all around the world with all of the dangers and trials in doing so. Well, if I told you that the spice could be sold with a markup of 32,000% when it got home, I think you'll see why some people thought it was worth the journey. So what was the situation here? The people of the Banda Islands would trade happily with the British, they would trade happily with the Dutch, but when the Dutch started getting a little too interested in taking control, the people decided instead to approach the British and offer their loyalty. One small problem, the Britishers who made their way to run Ireland were not representatives of the British Crown, however much the King actually did rather like his nutmeg. They were employees of the East India Company, and companies, certainly not a relatively newly formed one like this one, could not legally lay claim to any piece of land with or without the encouragement of its inhabitants. So they accepted on behalf of the Crown. But after the Dutch blockaded the island for four years, the company wanted to cut its losses. Well, not so fast. Did I mention the King loved his oh. nutmeg? He wanted to stand by his subjects on Run Island, in other words, get continued access to his nutmeg, and to that end, it was arranged for the company to be issued with a new charter that included the authority to hold, fortify and settle overseas territories. All because of this tiny, tiny island and its precious produce. Not because the company saw those powers, kind of, by accident. Oops. And certainly not at that point anyway, because it had the slightest inkling of using those powers to take control of places like Bombay, Bengal, 
all of that was to come. India likewise had no inkling of what the future held in store, it was more focused at that time in local power struggles. This was when the Mughal Empire was expanding. The Mughal emperors were ridiculously wealthy and powerful, heading an empire that seemed significantly more advanced than anything the first British traders could lay claim to. The only thing the British and other outsiders could offer that interested the Mughals was bullion. Like the Chinese in the next century, they considered themselves to be so far ahead, nobody else had anything they could ever be interested in. The idea that one day these traders would rule India would have seemed ridiculous to both sides, but it didn't last. Circumstances pushed it along, and two abrasive characters pushed it even further and faster. Those characters, one was Siraj Udwala, a Mughal regional governor who was known for being aggressive and headstrong. The other was Robert Klein, a hugely ambitious employee of the East India Company. Siraj made himself a nuisance, and because of his rudeness, the British treated him with contempt often barring him from even visiting their factories. His predecessors had developed quite an effective way of dealing with the British over the past decades. They recognised there was a delicate balance. They could profit from the British activities, but if they pushed them too hard, they understood there might well be repercussions. Siraj, however, was irritated by their presence and rather worried about where things might develop in the future. Elsewhere in India, he'd heard reports of Nawabs like him being forced under the control of the French, and he thought surely the British would follow suit. Indeed, he noticed that the British were strengthening their fortifications without his permission, mind, which he took as confirmation that that was exactly what they were intending to do. In fact, it probably had more to do with the decline of the Mughal Empire and the fact that meant there were lots of rising potential threats, not least from the French themselves. In June 1756, he mobilised an army of 50,000 men and took the Brits by surprise. Siraj was really pleased with himself, decided, well, maybe he hadn't needed to worry so much about the British after all. Some of his guards went even further with some of the British prisoners they had in their custody. They put a large group of them in a hellishly hot punishment cell, which resulted in possibly as many as a hundred of them dying. The incident became known as the Black Hole of Calcutta, and even though there was no evidence that Siraj had directly authorised it, for the British it became a symbol of his barbarity and a justification for striking back. The news of the atrocity came through just as the young, highly ambitious Robert Clive arrived back in India after a visit home. He was sent to Bengal with an army of 2,000 troops. Bear in mind that whatever was in Robert Clive's mind when he went to Bombay was not the settled will of the East India Company. The directors just wanted to protect those profits. They didn't understand, given the distance they were from the events on the ground, how much that was going to involve getting involved with the local politics. The people who were there simply took on themselves the authority to take whatever actions seemed to them to make the most sense. And so it was, after some fudging and politicking, Clive's forces met for a final showdown with Siraji's forces at the Battle of Plessy. Now, you and I might look at the maths on this one and think it could only go one way. Siraj had an army of 50,000. Clive had an army of 2,000. No great military experience of his own to call on. You wouldn't bet on those odds, but he did have some political cunning. And during that period of politicking and fudging that I mentioned, he had noticed that Siraj didn't have an awful lot of support around him, thanks to that habit he had of being obnoxious to everybody. And so he went to Mir Jaffa, Siraj's chief general, who was the focus of a plot to oust Siraj. And he promised him the East India Company's support as the new Nawab. With that understood, when Clive's forces launched their attack, Mir Jaffa didn't provide a very vigorous counter, and Siraj decided to flee, taking with him just his favourite concubine. As you do, 
but he didn't flee fast enough or far enough because Mir Jaffa wanted to remove him as a possible rival and had him caught, summarily executed and then had his body carried around the city on an elephant for all to see. And so started the process, ratcheting up a degree of support and compliance from the local rulers for the company's operations. And services were rendered both ways. When the Mughal Crown Prince led an invasion, Clive's forces helped to push them back. In thanks, he was given the right to land tax revenues of £28,000 a year. And the company came to demand more and more revenue-raising powers. When Mir Jaffa started to get annoyed with the company's growing greed, the company had him replaced with his even more compliant son-in-law. None of this sat entirely well with the company directors. When Clive went back to Britain, fabulously wealthy and full of his own self-importance, they kind of tried to pull him down a peg or two. They were concerned about corruption in the Indian operation and pushed to oust Clive from his position with the company. He was saved by the same thing that ratcheted up British control of India a notch. The new Narwhal, more compliant but not endlessly compliant. He took exception to the company's private trade in Bengal and war broke out between him and the company. It still feels kind of weird to be saying that war broke out with a company. But these were different times. The London directors, somewhat panicked at the potential loss of its profitable base, found a sudden dose of forgiveness for Clive's sins and they sent him back to India to sort things out. He not only destroyed the Nawab, installed a new, even more compliant Nawab in his place, but he also made sure that the company was granted all revenue-raising powers. In other words, the company now collected taxes from the citizens and decided how much to pass on to the Nawab. This was the moment when the company made the government of India its actual business. Not because the directors had set out a strategic plan to make their money that way, but because they had lost control of people on the ground, one thing had led to another. Again, sort of accidental. Oops. But now they cross that line, one thing led to another at a very rapid pace. Territory after territory was annexed. Every time justified in terms of protecting the company's interests. Taking Robert Clive's lead, ambitious and greedy employees enriched themselves with adventuring, extorting money from local Nawabs and taking over the mechanisms of tax collection. The company directors remained largely clueless about the details of all this activity. They just knew that their people on the ground kept bragging about all of the wealth that was about to start flowing their direction and they were getting impatient to see some of it arriving. At one point they did begin to suspect that their orders that trade be carried out using peaceful means might not be entirely entirely being honoured, they decided to send a three-man supervisory commission, which might have changed the course of history, except that, unfortunately, their boat sank on leaving Cape Town, and that was the end of them. And here's the thing, the company's move from trading with India to actually running the place turned out not to be a profitable stroke of genius after all. In fact, the period following Clive's innovation and the expansion of our approach elsewhere led to real financial problems for the East India Company. Why? Well, firstly, it turns out that running complex tax systems in cultures completely different to your own can be kind of tricky. And then there's events like the 1770 famine in Bengal. And while it can seem great in theory that you have political control and you can just get people to give you money, it's very easy to forget that there's a real cost to keeping that political control. Clive raised four million pounds of tax from the provinces he conquered, but while he reported all of that as profit, a large part of it was probably swallowed up by the huge administration costs not to mention the military defence for the operation. Then, when you went to war to take another territory, that would eat up large amounts of your existing resources. Politically cunning they may have been, military skilled they may have been, economically literate, yeah, well, not so much. Back home, the East India Company began to be buffeted by a succession of financial crises, and this huge, powerful enterprise became mired in debt. 
And then something else began to happen, one of the great ironies of the British Empire. From the 1820s onwards, the growth of moral sentiment amongst the British people led to growing levels of interest in how one should be dealing properly and fairly with native people. New ideas were taking root, the responsibilities of good government, liberals, utilitarians, evangelicals all had their own ideas on the subject. For the first two, it was about the rule of law, education, free trade. For the evangelicals, of course, it was about saving people by converting them to Christianity. Evangelicals spread across India. And as far as most British people were concerned, this was doing the Indian people a massive favour. European laws and institutions and practices were also self-evidently superior, they thought, that you were basically saving them from a savage state of superstition, and then it came to an inevitable bloody end. In 1857, some of the British noticed something strange starting to happen. Indigenous officers and villagers started sending each other chapatis. Yes, I said chapatis, flatbreads. They went from village to village, from regiment to regiment. Nobody knew what it meant. Actually, even today, people don't agree on what it was all about. Maybe it was the Indian people signalling to each other their readiness to revolt. Maybe it was an attempt to appease the Hindu gods at another outbreak of cholera. I don't know. Maybe it was an early experiment with pop-up restaurants. We don't know. Whether the swapping of chapatis was a symbol of it or not, the truth is resentments were reaching a boiling point. And in the army, the Indian soldiers were particularly aggrieved because of how they were treated by the British commanders. And as I mentioned earlier, the trigger came when they decided, whether it was true or not, it was obviously a possibility given the other things, that the rifle cartridges they were told to use were greased with beef fat or pig fat, the former being offensive to Hindus, the latter to Muslims. Some of the soldiers were imprisoned for refusing to use the cartridges, and that didn't go well with their colleagues, who shot the British officers dead. And so began the Great Mutiny. They moved on to Delhi, attracting more and more people as they travelled. There they killed British officers and their families. The British, led by William Hodson, counterattacked and lay siege to Delhi. Meanwhile, rebellion spread across large parts of India. At Cawnpore, several hundred white women and children were murdered, an event that the British could focus on to spur their outrage and their belief in the savagery of the enemy. So they no doubt felt justified when they murdered and tortured men on the other side. No one emerged with huge amounts of credit from these events. In spite of all the flying chapatis earlier, there was no great coordination or organisation behind the mutiny. In Delhi, the nominal leader, the aged Bahadur Shah, struggled to control the mutineers who became more interested in looting local shops and enriching themselves than they were in overthrowing the British. And when the British finally attacked Delhi, there were days of street fighting, during which many of the British soldiers got drunk on alcohol that they found and attacked and robbed civilians. But the rebellion was eventually, over the course of more than a year, crushed by the company. So, the East India Company triumphant. Yes? Oh no. It was the end of corporate control of India. The mutiny forced the British government to clarify once and for all that the company wasn't, well, you know, a company, able to do whatever it wanted in order to make profits. Instead, it was an agent of the British Crown, and that meant that a British Secretary of State was put in charge, and that was that. The East India Company limped on for a while before finally ceasing to exist as a legal entity in 1874. The British Empire, having been brought into being by this remarkable string of corporate accidents, continued for a long time to come. Today, of course, the British Empire has long since followed the East India Company into deserved oblivion. But major multinational corporations continue to site themselves around the world, hoping to make a profit while navigating those local politics. They don't have private armies anymore, which we can take as a good thing. And with instant communications, head offices, wherever they may be, have no excuse for being out of touch with what's happening on the ground. But the questions about power, 
how it affects communities, how it gets held to account, those continue to be very much live topics. And I will be certainly covering those again in future videos on this channel. If that's something you'd like to see, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit that notifications bell.